The last video was all about the must-own, must-read first Cloak & Dagger limited series, where we finally got the full origins and even the name for Tandy and Tyrone. Plus an added kick of them finally going for the positive sort of vigilante justice and not just the eye for an eye kind. So with a new mission statement, let's dive into Marvel Team Up Annual Number 6, with Mantlo still moving these characters forward, but Ron Friends and Kevin Zuban are on art this time. Spider-Man is on patrol, and when going after some car thieves, he runs into Cloak and Dagger. They all kick the butt of these car thieves, but Cloak and Dagger are actually there for more on-point matters, such as a backroom full of dead kids. Why are these kids dead? Well, the criminal underworld is trying to make anti-Cloak and Dagger kids, which is not going well, obviously. But enough about that. It's New Mutants time, as the Next Generation X team from way back when, that no one may remember really well, comes out of the Broadway hit furry musical, Cats. But this is the Marvel version of New York City, so naturally that means some rando is ready to start stabbing people because Rain refuses to show him her highlands, if you know what I mean. This leads, of course, to them running off, only to be met with an army of jackasses the likes only Batman Arkham games can muster. Basically, all this boils down to Roberto, or Sunspot, and Rain, or Wolfsbane, being carried off after being separated and knocked out by assumably the bad guys killing kids to get a cloak and dagger. Back with what's more important to us, Spider-Man is swinging around New York and actually comes across a very special church in Hell's Kitchen. No, it's not Daredevil's church, but the church that Cloak and Dagger takes sanctuary in. They're taking the fact that Runaways are dying because of them very hard. But for obvious reasons, it's Dagger being very vocal about her emotions. But enough about the character stuff as Cannonball or Sam Gunthry and Psyche or Danny Moonstar runs into a church only to be met with Cloak poofing at them aggressively. This causes Danny to use her power of projecting a target's worst fear, and Cloak sees his darkness going out of control and consuming everything. Now, I'd want to say that this is some deep revelation about the character, but it's kind of an obvious thing once we've seen this character freak out about this so much. Spidey does defuse the situation, and Sam explains everything. Can I honestly say that I do love this tiny little arrow, because it denotes that there's a story being told, but it isn't trying to pad itself out, if we exclude the Broadway's adventures of the New Mutants before the actual meat of this plot kicked off. Granted, that's also sort of nullified when Petey gives a basic backstory of Cloak and Dagger, but that is actually kind of justifiable, since it gives a better reason for why mutants being experimented on cannot be a good thing. So Cloak and Dagger poof off to stop it. Petey and the gang also depart to try and find them, leaving Father Francis in the same position Spider-Man usually is when he meets up with Cloak and Dagger. So how are Sunspot and Wolfbane doing? Well, they're tied to a butcher's block with a mad scientist ready to inject them. This does take three pages, but it does bring something up that will come up later in Cloak and Dagger's books. Perhaps the drugs didn't give them their powers, but merely unlocked a latent mutant gene. However, what works well for this story is that Sunspot and Wolfbane are actually injected moments before Cannonball and the cavalry arrive. Action ensues. But the biggest threat is the fact that Rain and Roberto are now monster versions of themselves. Roberto is easily nullified by Cloak sucking him into his cloak, but when Wolfbane bites Dagger, Dagger's light cures Rain, but in turn, the drug gets into Dagger's blood. Now equally crazed, Dagger unleashes at Cloak, with Cloak enveloping Dagger. It may be a hindsight look, but Mantlo really turns this moment into Dagger, though crazed, actively trying to burn out both her and Cloak's darkness, just because of this one panel of them looking nearly defeated by their curse. But literally the wrap-up is that Spidey suggests they go to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. They refuse and then poof off. Oh hey, Spidey's actually left in the dark looking pensive. Take a shot. Though this time at least he has other people to talk to, so it's not him crying alone in the darkness. Cloak and Dagger's next appearance is in the three-part storyline running through Spectacular Spider-Man number 94 through number 96. But now Al Milgram is holding the writing pen and the art pencils with finishes by Jim Mooney. In a secret lab, Wilson Fisk and The Answer, just another masked villain, are trying to revive a long-dead body. Elsewhere, Cloak and Dagger are stopping some drug dealers when Dagger suddenly stumbles over, weakening as if her light was being pulled from her. Apparently, Dagger's light is the light of all life, allowing her to give or take it away. I have no idea where this came from, since it's never been talked about in such a literal way before. Remember, she tried giving life in the miniseries and failed at it. After Cloak deals with the drug dealers, don't worry, he's a spitter now, Cloak and Dagger poof off to find out where her light went. Now, I will skip the Peter Parker stuff for the most part. Don't worry, the gigantic reader's history of Spider-Man will eventually come out when I can afford it. I'll only say that this is post-Secret Wars, where Spidey has the alien symbiote suit before the whole Venom fiasco, though that does kind of come to a head during the story. 
Anyways, while en route to a booty call from Black Cat, Petey gets hindered by a guy being hunted down by... Silvermane! You remember Silvermane, right? He was killed by Cloak and Dagger, only to be revived as a robot to be killed by them again, to now be back for a third time. One more and he may have more resurrections than Jay-Z's career. Of course, Silvermane is mainly just a robotic, mindless husk, now being controlled by the answer. Fun side note, the Kingpin actually doesn't want Silvermane to kill Spidey, because it interfere with his ultimate revenge plot he has going on. The rest of the issue is basically Spidey getting wrecked, as the kids would say, before he flees the Black Cat's apartment to say that they need to find Cloak and Dagger. Issue 95 starts with PD resting, and Black Hat going off to find Cloak and Dagger alone, while Silvermane has begun to act on his own, being drawn to Dagger. Why? Well, as the answer explains, since he's one of them know-it-all masked villains, Dagger was the reason he died last time, using her light knives, which absorbed his life into her. So therefore, he has a primal bond, drawing him to her, and she should be feeling that pull as well. See, that is an answer that I can at least live with, compared to the whole, y'all connected with a life stream hand wave from the first one. This at least expounds on her powers being similar to Cloak's, with the whole draining angle. But anyway, skipping a lot of the non-Cloak and Dagger side stuff, we eventually reach a huge heroin deal going down at the docks. Yo, you got my shipment of Harley Quinns? I've got comic junkies waiting. Okay, bad joke, I know. By the way, at this point in the story, we know this is a trap, so we see everyone setting up their location. Dagger is too weak to help stop the drug deal, though, so Cloak goes in alone. Yet that means he's going to feed on these guys for their light, which Dagger doesn't like, so she gives the last of her light to feed Cloak. But now that Dagger's appeared onto the scene, everyone springs forward. The trap was for her. So, you have the Kingpin's goon, trying to get her to save Vanessa, Kingpin's wife whose inner light got snuffed out by Sewer Outcast and Daredevil 180, Black Hat and Spider-Man trying to save her from the trap, Cloak trying to just save her period, Silvermane who just looks like he's about to take a bite out of Dagger's booty, and Dagger who just doesn't want to be drawn and quartered by this mob. The winner, however, is the answer, who can also apparently fly, but given the outfit he's wearing, sure, why not? Cloak absorbs Silvermane and some thugs to have enough light to try and find Dagger. All this leads to Spectacular Spider-Man number 96. Cloak has to spit out the goons as Silvermane wrecks his dark dimension. And yes, it is now snowing, in August, because of the events of Thor 349. I always dig that Marvel used to have tie-ins like this because it gave a real scope to the 616 as a whole. Silvermane does eventually break loose of Cloak's dark dimension though, leaving him weak and in a snowdrift. Of course, I will probably have a few comments if I didn't mention that this is also the issue that Spidey returns to his blue and red pajamas due to not trusting the symbiote. But more importantly, Dagger is in the clutches of the Kingpin and the Answer, yet she's too weak to cure Vanessa. But the biggest failing of their plan? The vengeance-seeking Silvermane comes crashing through Kingpin's skyscraper lair. Skipping over some more of the tie-in stuff from the big brouhaha from the Thor and Avengers books, Cloak does eventually walk through the blizzard to the Kingpin's fortress, but decides to avoid Silvermane's assault by teleporting to Dagger. But he's still severely weakened, so he has a glass jaw and the answer knocks him out. Fear not though, Spidey and the Black Cat makes it through to the final boss. However, Black Cat Leroy Jenkins in and gets caught in Cloak's darkness. However, Silvermane breaks through the door. Yet in a fantastic show of who Wilson Fisk is as a character, he's the one who stands up to Silvermane. It's not because he knows he can win or anything like that, but because he must do everything to protect Vanessa. But he does get felled by Silvermane. So it is up to the answer to wake Dagger and save the day. In a blinding flash, the answer's body vanishes, while Dagger becomes supercharged. She gives back Silvermane's life force, or however that actually worked, and Silvermane just leaves. But Dagger is still brimming with power, so the Kingpin begs for her to save Vanessa, even uttering a please. But no, Dagger gives her excess light to Cloak. But even more than that, still at full power, Cloak and Dagger deny Vanessa the light because of who the Kingpin is, and then they just poof out and leave. Spidey and Black Cat get blamed for it all, but they leave, leaving only a bitter Kingpin and his comatose wife in the darkness. I will admit I kind of dislike how the Cloak and Dagger part of this wrapped up with the simple, nope, he deserves it. Not because the Kingpin doesn't deserve it, far from it, but because Vanessa is, while yes, married to the Kingpin, is an innocent in his schemes, and Dagger goes along with Cloak going no. But this wasn't so much a Cloak and Dagger story, as it was a story about the Kingpin trying anything he could do to save Vanessa. So I can't really be too annoyed that it would have a couple issues when relating to Tandy and Ty. Next, we go to the pages of Marvel Fanfare number 19 for Mantlo Pen's story. This time, it's Tony Salmon's on art. 
As any good story starts, we have a junkie getting a fix from his dealer. If he cooks this stuff right there, then you know you're at least guaranteed freshness. Of course, Cloak and Dagger take out the dealer and heal the junkie. It's their new default story. This story, however, is more focused on the fact that Tandy wants to be a kid rather than just a costumed heroine stopping heroin. Since Cloak cannot follow her into having a social life, she gives him a kiss on the cheek and then bounces off. Where else would a former dancer go besides the hippest discotheque? And yes, if you can't tell, the artist has shifted from Salmons to Rick Leonardi and Terry Austin. One of the hardest things to do is movement in sequential art, especially something like dancing. But by God, do these artists really make you understand that when seeing Tandy dance, there is nothing else like it on this world. Yes, I'm sure there's a really horrible joke about Sucker Punch I could make, but who actually remembers that movie, huh? But while she is being the dancing queen, a low-level goon realizes he can kidnap her and give her to the mob for a huge prize. And he actually does so quite easily, because she's kind of dazed, knocking her out and hopping into a cab to deliver her. All the while, Cloak searches the night for her light. Jackie, the mobster that did kidnap Dagger, does indeed deliver her to his uncle, getting a briefcase filled with a hundred thousand bucks, which isn't too shabby for your average person, but I'm not sure about the price on superheroes. But Dagger awakes from her stupor and does her dance of dazzling light to take them all out. Except for Jackie. He gets out of the room running away with his money at the first sign of trouble. However, he runs straight into Cloak, and if you can guess it, it goes fantastic for him. The only reason that I'm talking about this issue in depth instead of just glossing it over as a quick one-shot story is because of this ending and what I think it finally hits home so well. While Cloak comes in to aid Dagger, everyone is already on the ground, and then it all comes together for Cloak. Dagger's power is no different than his own. She disrupts and feeds on the light as much as he must to keep his darkness in check. However, while he has embraced that he is no longer human, Tandy will continue to strive for normalcy, for innocence, for humanity, even if it breaks her. And that is why I think Mantlo wrote this one-shot. It's not a giant sweeping multi-part story or their past being avenged. It is frankly a story that only matters because Cloak, and more importantly the audience, can truly get the grasp that this isn't a one-way relationship with Cloak and Dagger, but almost a Mobius strip. Sure, they're two characters, but they'll almost always be as one. That may be a bit nerdier than anticipated for me to explain. But now it's time we say goodbye, at least for now. That was part three of the reader's history for Cloak and Dagger. Next time we'll be heading over to the New Mutants book for a four-part story. So be sure to click that subscribe button, hit that bell, and let me know what you think about the stories we talked about in this video, or any of the topics that I brought up. While you're down there in the comments, if you're interested in suggesting some other characters, teams, or huge events for Reader's History, let me know. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and please consider supporting our Patreon so I can get out of using Windows Movie Maker and getting a better mic. But even just that thumbs up and sharing helps the channel in a big, big way. We have a ways to go before we hit that 1K remonetization goal. But more than that, I'm the Comic Archivist, and stay golden, Inklings!